Hi, my name is Brandon Donnelly and I am the Simulation Product Manager here at DSC. In this video, I'm going to show you how SOLIDWORKS Simulation has three different measures and how you can make the most of each of those by understanding the difference in where they're applicable. SOLIDWORKS Simulation is a tool, but it does rely on the knowledge of the user to get the most value out of it. More skilled users will bring more value with the tool and as a result, increase their value to their companies. So let's get into it and show you a little bit more about the measure types available in SOLIDWORKS Simulation and how you can use them to your advantage. In this video, I have SOLIDWORKS open here and I'm going to demonstrate to you the three different measure types and what they do inside of SOLIDWORKS Simulation. Now it's important to understand these because they make you more efficient at what you do. The standard measure is good for prismatic parts. The curvature based measure is good for parts that are sort of curved and smooth organic shapes all around. And the blended curvature is good for when you have parts that are prismatic, but also that maybe have fillets all around it. So really understanding the settings and how these meshes work is a key to being able to get efficient meshes that run quickly and give you accurate results. So the first one that we have here is the mesh, uh, the standard mesher. And under the mesh, we can go ahead and click Create Mesh. And we can see the three default options here that it gives us on the left here under Mesh Parameters. So the standard mesher is the most basic. It basically chops the domain and the part up into a grid. Um, and it deletes ones, it deletes nodes that fall off of that grid. And then it merges the other ones next to it. And really what we have is we have a global size, which is the, the spacing between those, those grid layers. And then we have a tolerance size, which is basically if features are much smaller than that, they'll, they'll end up getting ignored and, and meshed over. Um, and that's really it, just two different settings. And what we get when we, we mesh this is we get something that looks like this. Um, this is a pretty simple shape. I mean, it's basically a square with a hole in it and then everything is filleted. And you can see that you can imagine, you know, you get these nice triangular uh, tetrahedrals that are stacking into sort of square shapes nicely. And then you have, you know, elements of similar size along the, the fillet. So this is a good way except to mesh, except for the fact that oftentimes we need to get more mesh in the fillets. And we could overcome this in the standard mesher by applying mesh controls all over the place. Um, that's pretty simple to do. You can come in here, apply mesh control, select all those fillets. But if you have hundreds of fillets, that quickly adds up to a lot of faces that you need to select. And that's where the curvature based mesher comes in and plays a more vital role in helping us solve that challenge. So I'm going to switch over to this next uh, file here, uh, same analysis, next analysis tab. Um, and we'll take a look at the curvature based measure. And right here you can see that we've selected curvature based. And now this has a few different settings than what the standard mesh had. It has a maximum element size, it's got a minimum element size, the minimum number of elements in a circle, and then an element size growth ratio. So these two here are entirely new um, and then we only had a single element size and a tolerance we didn't have a maximum and a minimum basically what this is asking you for is how many on your curvatures how many elements need to be used to go around a circle in that manner and then the growth rate is how fast do we move between that maximum element size that that we're trying to get to for efficiency and the minimum element size that it may be using on any areas of high curvature. So with just these settings here, I'm going to I'm going to take this back to maybe something a little bit bigger and let's use a little bit, you know, more round numbers to make this easier to visualize. I'm going to start with um, four tenths of an inch, and then we'll go minimum size of a, a tenth of an inch. We'll use 36 as our minimum number to um, minimum number of elements in a circle and then our growth rate of three and we'll just go through this and see how it changes as we as we mesh things so this basically starts with your curvature you can see it looks a little bit different than the standard measure in that the inside here is not as uniform as the standard measure was 
Um, that's because this is starting from the curved elements rather than just breaking this into just a straight grid. And so we don't always end up with as normal looking of elements as there is there uh, in the standard measure. Now these elements in here don't look too different in size compared to what we saw over there, but part of that is in the standard measure, part of that comes from the fact that we are we have a fairly large minimum element size here. If I reduce this down significantly and we remesh this, you'll see that in trying to meet that 36 elements in a circle, that now that we've given it an appropriate minimum element size, it will add many more elements in those fillets than what it did previously. And this is really the power of the curvature-based measure if you know how to use it. When you have fillets all over the place and you need to refine the mesh on all of those fillets rather than selecting them for individual mesh controls, you put in the correct values into the curvature-based measure, and it will do that globally for you. So if you look at this now, you can see how well-refined those elements are by comparison to what they were previously, and it holds true across all of the fillets that are in this part. And you can see that we still have some irregularity in the, in the middle here. It's not as structured as the standard measure was. Um, one thing to note is how large it does transition to in the middle by comparison to the size of those elements. And part of that comes down to the growth rate. So the growth rate is how much bigger each successive row can be than the last. Um, and if we just make a quick change to that as an option in the curvature based measure, we'll put it from three, which is the maximum growth rate, down to 1.1. And you can see how much tighter these elements will stay. Now this will be creating much more mesh, which generally gives you more accuracy, um, but that's assuming that you have a large stress gradient across this whole thing when you actually run a study. But at the same time, it's going to create more mesh, which means more solution time for you, and that's always the trade-off that we're looking at in simulation versus, uh, is accuracy versus time. And the more skilled you are as a user, the more you minimize that trade-off um, by knowing where it needs more mesh and where you can get away without having a lot of mesh. And now, while this is solving, GSC is putting together a number of resources to help people continue along that path of discovery. It's not always an easy thing to learn on your own. Um, so we will be doing office hours that allow you to come in, present some files to us, review them, even if there's nothing wrong with them, or you can also come and talk about files and projects that you worked on that maybe didn't come to fruition or that you weren't able to get to run, and we can talk through how to get that to be um, more useful for you in the future. And even here you can see that this is taking about you know twice as long as previous, just changing that growth rate because we really are packing in many, many more elements than we did previously um, because each successive row has to stay very, very small as it transitions because you're only growing by 10% per row where before you were growing by 300% per row. Um, and so we, we'll see that this mesh here ends up coming out to be very, very dense. As you can see, this produces a crazy high dense mesh, um, far more than you would need for something like this, uh, especially if you're just putting a simple load in that hole or on top. So changing those factors can drastically change the mesh. Now, now that you understand a little bit about the curvature based measure, let's go to the final, which is blended, which makes use of both of those approaches. Um, and tries to give the structure of the standard measure, but the flexibility of the curvature based mesh on the fillets. So this uses the same controls as that curvature based measure. As you can see, you got your maximum element size, your minimum element size, min number of elements in a circle, 
and your element grow size. So we'll go ahead and click this and mesh it. And we'll kind of just look at how the, the structures compare. And as you can see here, you have a little bit more structure around the edge into the middle than you had in the, the curvature base mesh. Not quite as much as the standard mesher, but a little bit more. And you still have the control over the fillets based off the general mesher, which saves you having to apply all kinds of mesh controls. So that's the explanation of the different meshing types in SOLIDWORKS simulation, and I hope it's been useful to you. So those are the three types of meshers in SOLIDWORKS simulation. Knowing how to use them will allow you to solve bigger problems in less time, making you more valuable to your company and less of a commodity. Like I said before, my name is Brandon Donnelly, and I am the SOLIDWORKS simulation product manager here at GSC, and I'm here to help you do more and be more with your software. At the end of this, we'll have a way for you to find out more and contact me with my email address, and we look forward to seeing you in future videos.